I'm Dan Andreessen. I'm from Kansas State University. I direct our HPC Center. I'm a professor of computer science. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, work part time for the National Science Foundation as an expert consultant, uh, which means that I am an NSF program officer for the MRI. So we've talked a lot about CC Star. And uh, if you need a little more money, a little more time, a lot more money, not too much more time, uh, please submit. Uh, we are in the process of uh, funding a lot of, of really cool cyber infrastructure through the MRI program. Uh, I work uh, in part just to kind of balance in whatever fits best with, uh, with Kevin and Amy and others across, across the NSF. So I will cheerfully put in a plug for please uh, get your grant proposals in for the MRI program as well as CC Star. So the most relevant uh, role that I play is I'm the chair of the CIP, the Cyber, yeah, cyber Infrastructure See, I can't say cyber infrastructure either. I just say CI. Uh, the CIP uh, is the Cyber Infrastructure Program Committee. Been the chair for about 10 years now. Been involved for probably close to 20 of the Great Plains Network. And we kind of, well, GPN is this map. And you'll notice one thing about it. It's Spartan. Uh, one of the things that I learned when I moved to Kansas, uh, which I moved there from Nebraska via California, uh, was that uh, out in Western Kansas, I think we've got a laser on this thing for those of you, maybe? Oh, anyway, um, notice there isn't much in the left-hand side of any of these states. Uh, the population density of Western Kansas is actually less than that of the Sahara Desert. And <laughs> which was one of those, whoa, uh, moments when I learned this. Uh, the other thing that I found really amusing was that a Cabela's, which is kind of like a, it's a sporting goods store, heavily focused on fishing and hunting. Those of you in Wisconsin ought to really know this. I don't know if you got Cabela's up here. Uh, Bass Pro equivalent. Anyway, uh, one opened in Kansas City, and it was the top tourist attraction in Kansas for like five years running. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, we don't have a lot of people. And that's one of the things. I grew up on a farm outside Omaha, Nebraska. And one of the things I learned was that you had to be self-reliant because if you're in the middle of the field and the fence breaks or the tractor breaks or whatever it is, there isn't anybody within shouting distance. And this was pre-cell phone as well, but even if there were cell phones, there just aren't a lot of people around to help you. And so you grow this uh, trait of saying, I've got to be able to fix this myself. Um, also though, there's a strong tendency and a, a belief to be neighborly. Like we know that you can't do everything yourself, even if you're trying to be self-reliant, we're gonna help you out. Barn raising is more than just a thing, it's kind of an ethos or a mentality to say, how can we work together and help each other? Because we know we don't have the people and the resources and you know, for the vast majority of Nebraska, Kansas, uh, decent hunks of Oklahoma and stuff, um, AAA doesn't exist, but the neighbors do. And so you can call them and say, hey, I've got a flat tire. I've got a blah, blah. Please pull me out of the uh, ditch. This has happened to me personally. And they show up with a tractor or a four-wheeler and they do this. And so to me, what GPN feels like is essentially that just writ large in the cyber infrastructure place where we know we don't have the people and the resources to really do as much as we can. And yet we really want to help people. And so we work together to get that done. And so that's the Great Plains Network is really saying, how can we do this? It happens to occur in a region, well, basically the, the flyover states, if you want to do it that way, it's nine states. Uh, it's over 20 years old. And we do two things. We aggregate networks because uh, 20 some years ago, the way to get decent quality, decent uh, price per bit was to aggregate and preferably in Costco scale uh, bits and number of bits and gigabits per second. And so the Great Plains Network came together and said, hey, let's buy a bunch of access to Internet 2. I don't think Internet 2 was what it was called at the time. But at any rate, uh, the, the academic side of the Internet. And the other thing we want to do is we want to say, let's advance collaboration, cyber infrastructure, and support. And we still do both today. Um, it is very much based on the networks, at least in terms of the network side. The state regional networks are on one net more than Cameron uh, network. And I shouldn't have started this because now somebody's going to feel left out. Uh, Boreas and uh, South Dakota, that sort of thing. Uh, we, so we tied everything together, but the real goal that we have is yes, we supply network access to a large number of the uh, educational and a few others uh, folks in the state. And that's great. And it really helps them, they get a good deal and it provides them an excuse to charge them money to get some funding for what we do. 
Um, however, I'm not a networks guy. Well, ask me about HPC networks because I run our HPC center, and sure, I can, you know, uh, I can sympathize with a number of you about how irritated I am with Intel and the Omnipath Sega and InvinaBand and that sort of thing. But on the other hand, uh, wide area networks, I kind of say, oh, they're cool. I vaguely know what they do. Um, on the other hand, I spend a lot of my time working with users and particularly people that are using cyber infrastructure. And that's where we spend a lot of time today and a lot of times getting time getting things done. So the goal is, yeah, we started off kind of at the low level and then it works. And then we started building tools on top of that. But where I spend a lot of time and where the GPN spends a lot of time today is really on people and projects. And so what I'm going to do is talk about some of the projects that we've done, most of which are NSF funded, some of which aren't but that really illustrate this is what we're trying to do on top of the network and get people helped and going in, in the uh, region that we're talking about. So one of our projects is a CC star. And the good news is we've got a couple CC stars slides later. I don't have to talk about them. And so Cyber Team was a CC star uh, award. And it said, you know what? We've got a lot of small institutions in our region. Many of these are 1,000 students, 2,000 students, maybe 5,000 students. I mean, you can fit the entire population of Nebraska, it's about 2 million people, into Kansas City. I mean, there just aren't that many people in a lot of these places. Um, Kansas is relatively large. We have 3 million people in Kansas. Um, but on the other hand, so Cyberteam said, is there a way we can go out and work with these smaller institutions in particular? We're going to visit them. And because a lot of them need help with everything, you've got individual pockets of excellence, you've got professors that are doing fantastic research, but to a large degree, it's them, it's a few undergrad students, and that's it. And they aren't talking with central IT, and because central IT is dramatically overworked and just trying to make sure that everybody's Windows box is patched. And so HPC, HTC, uh, Globus, that sort of thing is this big term they might have heard about it, but it really hasn't happened. And so part of it was to get the people together. And so we had, well, see, I think our quad chart is next. Yeah. Okay. And so what we did is we said, let's get together and let's build a network of experts and expertise because, again, we don't have that many people in the region. But if we pull together the entire region and aggregate, we're awesome. <laughs> and so what we did is we said, hey, Let's pull together people, let's build mentors, let's start uh, having mentees and start training people and building the cyber infrastructure workforce. Let's get people talking between the professors and the students that are doing the research and central IT and whatever the equivalent of the vice president or vice chancellor of research. A lot of these places, well, technically they have one, but it's a slice of their time among eight other hats that they're wearing in these smaller places. And so the goal was to say, let's come in and we're gonna bring 10 people. I mean, a lot of times we were outnumbering the people at the institution that we're talking with. And um, then COVID came along and of course it was just outnumbering the people on the Zoom calls that we were talking with. But getting the people in the same room and talking, really saying, how can we help you? And it isn't just a come in. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember the uh, Dilbert Bungie boss. Uh, you know, hey, everything goes buzz about buzzwords and then bounce out But no, it was a long-term multi-year commitment. And it's ending now, officially, we aren't gonna get money, more money from the NSF. On the other hand, it's continuing now because we're building those relationships. The people that were mentors are continuing to mentor. The people that were mentees are continuing to say, hey, how do we do this? We're continuing to talk with them. So Cyber Team was great. However, one of the things we noted was particularly for a lot of these places, they had no hardware, which was you know perfectly reasonable. But on the other hand, they really felt like we like to contribute. There's a massive educational value to be able to walk my class down the hallway and say, that machine is doing X. This is our way of contributing. This is a way of working with things. But a lot of them don't necessarily have uh, data centers. They don't, certainly don't have the expertise to manage a scientific computing enterprise, that sort of thing. And so for that, we came up with GP Argo. Um, I'm co-PI on the Cyber Team grant. I'm PI on the, uh, on the GP Argo grant, co-PI and another one we're talking about a little bit later here. Uh, but the goal was to say, let's actually buy, in this case, we ended up with about 18 different machines. Let's buy these machines, spread them out through the region. And we're going to use this as, first of all, capacity building, because we always need more cycles in the region. But second of all, we're going to use this as a lever to get people talking. Because if you've got a researcher in a small institution and they're doing research, 
they don't have a strong incentive to develop the relationship. To, well, they have an incentive, but in general, central IT doesn't have a strong in incentive to get people talking. The VPR doesn't have a, a strong incentive to get people talking because they're busy, they're overworked, they're underfunded, yay, all of us. But what they can do is they say, if the researcher goes to central IT and says, hi, I'd like to put a uh, relatively expensive box. These were on the order of $27,000 each. I'd like to put a box in and we're gonna use it for research computing. All of a sudden, central IT has to take, uh, has to pay attention because, oh shoot, they're gonna need holes in the firewall. Hag! Uh, so we need to talk about this. What do you need? What are you, where are you gonna stick it? Who's gonna manage it? What's the security and the cybersecurity implications? What's the research that's being supported? The VPR says, oh, we're getting a $20,000 box. This is a nice little bullet point for me to talk with when I'm reporting to the president, reporting to our advisors. And so one of the cool things was, not only was it just uh, chips and cycles and GPUs and other good, good and very useful things, but it was something where you started developing an infrastructure for people to start talking that weren't talking previously. And that's really useful. So that when we start saying, hey, what? You know what? Let's start developing some int intrinsic capabilities. Let's start taking some of the people on your IT team and start mentoring them in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, because a lot of them have never heard of things like ESNet and the DMZ and the thought of, ah, you mean you don't run some Windows-based uh, antiviral software? Ah, we're banning it on the campus. Um, and it, and it's, it's really neat to see the relationships that are building within this campus because we're handing on a piece of hardware. So the other cool thing, uh, and Derek, where is the heck is Derek? There he is, he's talking later, he'll talk more about this. Derek came up with some awesome uh, di dashboards, digital dashboards that we're talking about. So a couple of things happened. The first thing that happened, and to me, the most valuable is that people started talking, which is great because we really need those relationships to build. Um, and if we were successful enough that for instance, we have four or five institutions in Oklahoma that said, hey, we've got some machines that are left over from other previously funded projects. The projects are ended. Machines are sitting there. Can we join GPRGo? And I said, awesome. And we did it. So we contributed these resources. And so this is from yesterday. We've contributed 16 million core hours. Um, I also noted from, I think it was Marone's slides on uh, yesterday, that we're top five in OS pool, which for a underfunded, underdeveloped, under-resourced region in the middle of the flyover states, makes me feel really gratified. And I delight in pointing this out to my friends at UC Santa Barbara and you know, on the coast and this sort of thing, that, that that string running right up the Missouri, basically, that's us. And, and this was something where, hey, I'll give plenty of credit to the NSF because without that, it probably wouldn't have happened. I've learned over my decades as a professor, if you come bearing money, people listen to you a lot more than if you don't come bearing money. And so it's a great way to get people talking. So top five, the other cool thing is that if you look at these list of schools, well, some of them you'd expect, you know, the Oklahoma states and the Kansas states and uh, Arkansas states and University of Arkansas and that sort of thing. Sure, there are ones, there are 20 some thousand students, you'd expect to see them on there. On the other hand, the Langstons and the Southeast, state Missouri, uh, Southeast Missouri State University and Emporia State and Doan and Creighton, they didn't exist on the OSG map they basically didn't exist on the CI map until we got them on there. And that's something where OSG played a critical role. Without it, we couldn't have managed all these machines because we had to offer to manage all these machines. And are you about to give me the time? Excellent, okay. Um, and so uh, we got these machines talking, these sorry, machines, we got the machines in there, which was working. Uh, this is something, by the way, I never want to do in my life again. Uh, because I had 18 different machines in 18 different places, which meant I had to negotiate with 18 different IT organizations, most of which wouldn't know research if it hit them in the, in the back of the butt or whatever, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, let's explain this again, how you aren't opening yourself up to an entire world of terrifying cyber attacks. Uh, so at any rate, it worked, we got it in there, I spent, I don't know how many hours on the phone, uh, but we got a lot of people working over there, we're contributing a ton of CPU hours to science. And again, these, these smaller institutions out there, they, are, they aren't necessarily the largest contributors. In fact, uh, you look at the next one, uh, Wichita State University, which didn't even have a cluster, well, a cluster to speak of until about three years ago. They're the top contributor, which is awesome. And so we, we're really bringing a lot of people in. It's something for the researchers and the schools to brag about. 
and to start talking and that sort of thing. Um, so really, I'm most proud of the of the partnerships that we developed between the schools and within the schools to actually talk about these things. Uh, we're adding HPC clusters. These GPU OSG nodes are increasing the level of confidence and security that we have with central IT. So they're starting to say, hey, we've got a cluster. It's not necessarily completely used. Let's donate part of that to OSG. So what turned out to be a 128 times 18, basically 2,000 core contribution, has led to approximately 20,000 cores being added to the overall OS pool, in part because we started saying, hey, let's take these and we can expand it and people are comfortable doing this. Um, so uh, basically our grant ended in well, June 30th, if I remember correctly. I owe Kevin a couple of reports and uh, I'm gonna delay as long as possible because the numbers will look better. Uh, and it's not because I'm a professor and put everything off to the last minute, I assure you. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's really cool because I think I can legitimately declare victory and go home in terms of this is what we're trying to do. So, as you probably all know, HPC and HCC is not the way a lot of scientists like to work. And so our next grant, which was just announced, is GP Engine. And GP Engine says, let's build off the PRP, the NRP, the National Research Programs for the... It's doing science for the way a whole lot, like 90 plus percent as far as I can tell, doing science the way researchers do science, which is in a GUI environment, which is, hey, let's pull up our Jupyter notebooks and our Kubernetes and going from there and saying, what can we do? So it's really a follow on to the HTC oriented, the pure, I've got a ton of commute, uh, compute that I need to do model of GP Argo and saying, okay, let's extend this to GP Engine. And so that's just been announced. We've got eight really beefy machines. They've got four E100s each. And they're like eight, they were like a hundred grand each or something like that. Uh, we're spreading them across six different institutions, if I remember correctly. Everybody in the region will have access to them, and we're democratizing access and really working on the long tail science as well as the large scale science. And um, we're building on this is how we're doing the. Uh, just going to say, okay, first of all, let's build the relationships. Second, let's get some HTC compute capacity, more traditional capacity. Now we're building on, let's build on the GUIs, let's continue building these relationships, building the science, building the people, it, it resources that we're working with, and we'll go on from there. So all of this wouldn't be possible without the CC STAR program. That's been introduced. I'm going to blithely skip over that. We've got lots of places in the region that have been impacted by this. You can look at this in your region, uh, at, at your, uh, at, at your um, when you're feeling really bored and want to go to sleep. Uh, we do have a number of successful proposals available. Feel free to ask. Um, other things that we do, uh, so we have the uh, carpentries, we have six seats for instructors, so we're trying to build out the trainers uh, within our region, and usually we manage to find six people who are willing to be trained and can help out with that sort of thing. We love the carpentries. We have a very active women in HBC. Uh, they meet at least once a month, but sometimes that de de devolves into once a week, darn it. Um, it's a lot of fun, and uh, going on from there, uh, we send a lot of volunteers off to uh, sign in with supercomputing. Again, trying to get people there who haven't been there before and watch their eyes light up and they go, whoa, this is awesome. And that's just a whole lot of fun. Now we do have a Nautilus. This is a relatively outdated screenshot. Thank you, Derek, for pointing that out. Uh, just to point out that we have this and a lot of this prior work is going into the uh, GP Engine grants. Uh, we're a networking concern, so we do DDoS and mitigation. Uh, but in uh, in summary, um, I asked Kate. Kate Adams is our is the administrator, system administrator, does all the web work, basically keeps GPN going. And we're also in the middle of uh, hiring a new director, so she's really been doing everything. And uh, Derek, I think, asked Kate, kind of, what's the point of GPN? How's it work? Why is it going on? And that sort of thing. And her response was. GPN initially brought campuses together by fostering personal relationships with individuals, and it stays together in the same way. And I thought that was the best summary of GPN that I've ever seen, because that's what it does. It really builds those relationships across the region. And as we develop relationships with you know, organizations like OSG and elsewhere across the region, but really uh, brings them together, brings the people together, and really does some cool stuff. And a lot of that also is being enabled by OSG. So thank you very much for OSG, uh, to OSG. Uh, without it, 
uh, a lot of these slides would look a lot grimmer and a lot harder and you need a lot more people and that sort of thing. So thanks for your flexibility. Thanks for allowing us to push you into some, well, hey, what if I am trying to run one single group of machines across 18 different campuses? And one of the campuses decided that they were going to arbitrarily cut off all of outgoing SSH connections, um, except the ones that were whitelisted. It's like, ah, crap, okay, how do we handle that? Um, so uh, thanks to all of our partners, we couldn't do it without you. And I think we're doing some pretty cool stuff. And with that, I'm open for questions.